my students to the massive open online course on money and financial markets. In today's module, we are going to discuss the current monetary and credit policy of India. In this module, we would have a brief overview of the processes of monetary policy formulation. That is how the government goes about formulating monetary policy. And we also need to understand how the RBI goes about the dissemination of information and policy communication, how it is carried out. We would also discuss about the various stances of India's monetary policy, along with the monetary policy committee's recommendations on the current monetary policy of India. The students should also note that RBI do regularly change their monetary policies, so they should go through the recent monetary policy just before their exam. Now, in India, the objectives of monetary policy evolved as maintaining price stability and ensuring adequate flow of credit to the productive sectors of the economy. With progressive liberalization and increasing globalization of the economy, Maintaining orderly conditions in the financial markets emerged as an additional policy objective. Thus, the monetary policy in India endeavors to maintain a judicious balance between the objectives of uh, uh, price stability, economic growth, and the financial stability of the economy. If we go about trying to understand the process of monetary policy formulation, we find that the process of monetary policy in India had traditionally been uh, very internal in nature with only, only the end product of action which was made public, which the people came to know about. Over time, this process became more consultative in nature, more participative and uh, the RBI or the officials were more articulate with their policies and also they did have an external orientation. The internal work processes have also been re-engineered to focus on technical analysis, coordination, horizontal management and more and more of market orientation. The process which led to monetary policy action entails a wide range of inputs involving internal staff, market participants, academics, financial market experts, and obviously the RBI's board. Several new institutional arrangements and work processes have been put in place to meet the needs of policy making in a more complex and fast changing economic environment. At the apex of the policy process is basically the governor, the governor of RBI, who is assisted closely by the deputy governors and they are guided by deliberations of the board of directors. A committee of the board meets every week to review the monetary, economic, and the financial conditions, and also they render various advices on policy. There are also several other standing and ad hoc committees or groups which also play a critical role with regard to any sort of policy advice. There is also an interdepartmental financial markets committee which focuses on day-to-day -day market operations and tactics, while periodic monetary policy strategic meetings analyzes strategies on an ongoing basis. If you look at this diagram, you will find that it shows or it shows the process of monetary policy formulation. The end result is the monetary policy, which is basically a very consultative and participative process. 
we do have the internal work process which comprises of the technical analysis, coordination and horizontal management. If we look closely at the chart, we will find that the monetary policy strategy meetings which are basically held to analyze the strategies on an ongoing basis. They also reviews the growth and inflation situation and the macroeconomic projections. These monetary policy strategy, meet strategy meetings are, an, are a very, very important constituent of the internal work process. In fact, the periodic consultations with the government, mainly the Ministry of Finance, which is meant to ensure coordination, is also another very important component of the internal work process. The resource management discussions with select major banks is another important part of the internal work process. While committees like financial markets committees, which are, which are basically reviews and manages the daily market, ad, uh, daily market operations and adopt strategies, they also form a very integral part of the internal work process. Along with the financial markets committee, we have the technically advisory committees on monetary policy and we also have periodic consultations with academics and market which form very important structure of the internal work process. Along with the internal work process which is comprising all these things, they together helps in the constitution of the monetary policy along with the central board of directors who reviews the stances of the monetary policy and the committee of the board meets weekly to review the monetary economic financial conditions and advice appropriately. Now when we try to look at the chart on the information dissemination and policy communication, here this chart effectively shows us the mode of communication that uh, the RBI carries on with the public. Now in this instance, three very important things have to be communicated to the public. One is the monetary policy stance, second is the policy research and analysis, while the third is the macroeconomic and financial data and information. The monetary policy stance is communicated by governors, the RBI governors policy statements, the governors press meetings, speeches by the top management and the different press releases of the RBI. The policy research and ana analysis is communicated or the information is disseminated by the quarterly macroeconomic and monetary developments, the annual reports of the RBI, the annual report on banking, the reports on currency and finance published by the RBI, the annual study on state finances, occasional papers of the staff studies or development research group studies, and analytical studies in the RBI bulletin. While the macroeconomic and financial data and information, this part is disseminated by the daily release of data on financial markets and monetary policy operations on the RBI website. We have the weekly statistical supplements. We have the RBI monthly bulletin. We have the forward-looking surveys, the handbook of statistics on the Indian economy published by the RBI, the database on the Indian economy published on the RBI website, and of course, the national statistical data page. Thus, the stance of monetary policy and the rationale are communicated to the public in these variety of ways. However, the most important of them is the quarterly monetary policy statements that are issued by the RBI. Further, these policy measures are analyzed in various statutory and non-statutory publications in various speeches and press releases of the RBI. Informations I have already said on areas relating to economy, banking and financial sector, they are released with stringent standards of quality and timeliness. This is very, very important from the part of the RBI. And dissemination, as I have already showed you in the previous chart, that the dissemination of information takes place through various channels and the RBI has also developed a real-time database 
on the Indian economy, which is available to the public at large through the website of the RBI. So students, my question to you is, what do you think were the various monetary policy stances that were taken by the policy makers for the Indian economy? The story of the Indian monetary policy from the early 90s to 2009 can be chronicled as follows. During this period, we had an Indian economy which was totally financially repressed. It was characterized by high statutory preemption, sectoral credit targets. It had an era of administered interest rates and fiscal dominance. And this whole uh, very uh, peculiar nature of the Indian economy traversed a sea change in its financial sector structure, conduct and performance through a comprehensive reform process. Slowly and slowly, the financial repression was progressively dismantled. The interest rates which were administered were slowly deregulated. The banking sector was liberalized. The financial and the money markets developed and fiscal dominance was reduced. And the Indian financial sector emerged as a market-oriented modern system by the mid-2000s. The monetary policy reform was a key element of this process. So till about the mid 1980s, monetary policy in India was more appropriately characterized as credit planning, wherein the main objective was to channel credit at cheap administered rates for the developmental needs of the economy. And the intermediary who took active part in this was basically the public sector banks. Inflation, if you talk about inflation, it was mainly dominated by structural shocks like floods, droughts, or change in oil prices. The first break in the monetary uh, policy formulation came around in the mid-80s when monetary targeting was adopted wherein the targeted path of monetary expansion was designed to fund the desired growth of GDP in nominal terms. What do I mean by desired growth of GDP in nominal terms? It essentially means that growth after accounting for a tolerable level of inflation in the economy. So throughout the RBI, uh, throughout these processes, the RBI had introduced a number of money market instruments in the late 80s together with deregulation of the interest rates on existing money market instruments. So mostly those who were lying in the peripheral ranges. Thus, we find that in the absence of a well-functioning money market and predominance of RBI credit to the central government, the primary tool of the monetary policy remained the traditional CRR or the cash reserve ratio, which aimed at controlling the overall money supply in the economy so that inflationary pressures could be controlled while also keeping in mind the major objective that banks should be giving credit to the commercial sector. So that was also very important uh, side by side along with controlling the inflation. So we find that besides fiscal dominance through significant automatic uh, monetization of the budget deficits deprived the RBI of any sort of operational autonomy. Now, uh, as the changing framework of monetary uh, policy in India continued from a, a policy of monetary targeting to a policy of augmented multiple indicators approach, the operation targets and processes also undergone uh, or also underwent a change. There was a shift from quantitative intermediate targets to interest rates as the development of financial markets enabled transmission of policy signals through the interest rate channel. 
At the same time, availability of multiple instruments such as CRR, the OMO, including LAF, had provided the necessary flexibility to monetary operation. While monetary policy formulation basically was a technical process, it became more consultative, it became more participative with the involvement of market participants, academicians and experts. The internal process which we had already studied before in the monetary policy formulation chart, the internal process was also re-engineered with more technical analysis and market orientation. In order to enhance the transparency in communication, the focus has been on dissemination of information and analysis to the public through the governor's monetary policy statements and also through the regular sharing of policy research and macroeconomic and financial information. And so we uh, slowly came into the new mil millennium which witnessed the introduction of modern monetary policy making in India whereby the monetary policy is signaled through periodic modification of the policy interest rates. The RBI's operating framework moved to the management of daily excess of liquidity or sometimes shortages of liquidity in the money market primarily through open market operations, outright through open market operations or sometimes through repos or the reverse repos. So this was implemented through the operation of the LAF, the Liquidity Adjustment Facility in 2000. So under the announced repo and reverse repo rates, RBI carried out the repo or the reverse repo operations thereby anchoring overnight money market rates within this corridor. The LAF, the Liquidity Adjustment Facility has settled into a fixed rate overnight auction mode since April 2004. The LAF operations continues to be supplemented by access to the RBI standing facilities which are linked to the LAF repo rate, the export credit refinance to banks and standing liquidity facility to the primary dealers. So understanding all these things, the latest monetary policy committee recommendations that I do have in hand at this point of time is the one that was released on in the meeting on September 30, 2022. So on the basis of the assessment of the current and the evolving macroeconomic situation, the monetary policy committee at its meeting in September 30, 2022, they decided to increase the policy repo rate under the LAF by 50 basis points to 5.9% with immediate effect. What is the consequence of this? The standing deposit facility rate stands adjusted to 5.65% and the marginal standing facility rate and the bank rate got adjusted to 6.15%. The MPC also decided to remain focused on withdrawal of accommodation to ensure that inflation remains within the target going forward while supporting growth. So these decisions were in consonance with the objective of achieving the medium term target for consumer price index inflation of 4% within a band of around plus minus 2% which obviously we have to keep in mind that growth has to be supported. So if we look at this inflation thing, we see that in the MPC's view, inflation is likely to be above the upper tolerance level of 6% through the first three quarters of 2022-23 with core inflation remaining high. The outlook is fraught with considerable uncertainty given the volatile geopolitical situation at this point of time, the global financial market volatility and the supply disruptions being experienced by the war that is going on at this point with Ukraine and Russia. Meanwhile, the domestic economic activity is holding up well and it is expected to be buoyant in this last stage of 2022-23, supported obviously by the festive season, the Diwali season and all amidst consumer and business optimism. The MPC was also of the view that further calibrated monetary policy action is warranted to keep inflation expectations anchored, restrain the broadening of price pressure and preempt any second round effects. And the MPC also felt that this action will support medium-term growth prospect of the Indian economy. 
Accordingly, that is why the MPC decided to increase the policy repo rate by around uh, 50 basis point to around 5.9 percent. The MPC also decided to remain focused on the withdrawal of accommodation so that the inflation uh, was ensured to remain within the target going forward while supporting growth as I have already said. All these things also had some impact on the global macroeconomic outlook. We can see that the global economic activity is weakening under the impact of the protracted conflict in the Ukraine and aggressive monetary policy actions and stances across the world. As financial conditions tighten in the world, the global financial markets are experiencing surges of volatility with sporadic sell-offs in equity and in the bond markets and the US dollars are also strengthening to a 20-year high. I mean, we all know what is happening with the rupee and the US dollars at this point of time. So the emerging market economies are facing intensified pressure from the retrenchment of the portfolio flows, uh, portfolios, uh, 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 funds going out from the economy, currency depreciations taking place in all major economies, reserve losses and financial stability risks, risks beside the global inflation shock. So as external demand deteriorates, their macroeconomic outlook is also becoming increasingly adverse. If we look at the Indian economy at this context, we find that the real GDP grew year on year by around 13.5%. While all constituents of domestic aggregate demand expanded year on year basis and expected to their pre-pandemic levels, there was a drag from net exports and that really provided an offset to the Indian economy. But on the other hand, the aggregate supply conditions are gradually improving uh, the southwest monsoon rainfall was 7% and above and uh, the spatial distribution was also good with some deficit areas and the acreage of the crops was 1.7% above the normal zone area and also the activity in the industrial and the services sector also remained on the expansionary side. The index of industrial production, however, slowed down to around 2.4% uh, year on year at, uh, at on year on year level in the month of July. But on the demand side, urban consumption is lifted by discretionary spending ahead of the festival season and rural demand is gradually improving. That's a very, very important point. Investment demand is also gaining traction as is reflected in rising imports and domestic production of capital goods, steel consumption and cement production. Merchandise exports also posted a modest expansion in the month of August. Non-oil, non-gold imports remained buoyant. So all in all we can say, we can conclude by saying that on growth, the improving outlook for agriculture and allied activities and a rebound in services are really boosting the prospect for aggregate supply. The government's continued thrust on capex, on improvement in capacity utilization in manufacturing and a pickup in non-food credit should sustain the expansion in the industrial activity that was stalled from the month of July. The outlook for aggregate demand is positive. As I have said already, that rural demand is also catching up and urban demand is expected to strengthen further with the typical upturn in the second half of the year. According to all the RBI surveys, consumers' outlook remains stable and, and farms in manufacturing, services and infrastructure sectors are optimistic about the demand conditions and sales prospect. So on the other hand, headwinds from any sort of geopolitical tensions, tightening of the global financial conditions and slowing of the external demand, these are posing the downside risk for the Indian economy to what is the one that is lagging behind is the net exports and hence to India's GDP outlook. But all in all, RBI's monetary policy stance really looks favorable and gives us a favorable outlook for the Indian economy at this point of time.